Hey guys, what's up? Welcome to your forest. Matthew Kristoff here. And uh, yeah, I got more ecosystem-based management stuff for you guys today. Uh, in another conversation um, from a workshop that uh, the Forest Research Institute put on regarding ecosystem-based management. Um, same workshop that Ed Grumbine spoke at the first day and I had on the podcast. And uh, really cool workshop, really got people together thinking about ecosystem-based management and how we can move forward and kind of planted the seed in people's minds and how we can push towards sustainability and and making sure that we collaborate and we don't think about our own specific, you know, specific management area. We think about the whole picture, right? Um, so today I brought on David Anderson and David Anderson is a, a consultant for the Forest Research Institute. Uh, his consultant company is Bandaloop. Uh, he's a program lead for the health, healthy relation or healthy relationships, the healthy landscapes program. He's a program lead for the healthy landscapes program for FRI, which is looking into ecosystem based management and, and how to incorporate that into landscape management and into society and that kind of stuff. Uh, he's also an adjunct professor for the UBC forestry program. Um, really cool guy. Heard a lot of great things about him. Um, knows his stuff, um, knows a lot about fire and that kind of stuff as well. And uh, yeah, it was a really cool conversation, really got more deeply into it, into into, into ecosystem-based management and kind of where we see it headed and how we can kind of sort this out. A lot of hard questions to ask with ecosystem-based management and a lot of people, it, it's hard to understand. You can't just, you could ask 100 people what ecosystem-based management is and they would, they would answer you 100 different ways. So just know that it's trying to be better, trying to manage better ecosystems and trying to do it collaboratively instead of pointing fingers and getting angry with one another, right? So trying to keep emotion out of it and trying to follow the science. And uh, yeah, it's, it was a really good conversation. I, I really enjoyed it and I hope you guys do too. I think you will. And uh, yeah, same three uh, same three sponsors as, as, as always. Uh, Greenlink Forestry, thanks a lot. Couldn't do this without you guys. Forest Resource Improvement Association of Alberta, same thing. They provide me with resources that uh, I would, wouldn't be able to justify doing this without. Uh, also, Damage Timber. Damage Timber, you go to damagetimber.com. Um, they're an apparel company. And uh, they're trying to support environmental sciences through the sale of their clothing. Uh, the 10% of all the sales that they make they put towards a scholarship for environmental science students. And so you can, yeah, you can support that through buying of clothes, right? We all buy clothes. Just like, why not support a good cause while you're at it? Um, so yeah, check them out. DamageTimber.com, your forest tenant checkout. You can get 10% off. And uh, yeah, that's about it. So uh, I hope you guys like this conversation. I know I really did. It was really, really cool. And it's a super complex conversation situation uh it's, it's hard to wrap your head around but i think we're starting to get the right narrative so uh make sure to uh rate and review also and comment and like me on facebook and linkedin and twitter and all that kind of stuff and we can try and get this information out there more and not just tell your friends too i haven't been saying that tell your friends about this <laughs> it really helps out so thanks a lot guys here we go all right uh so you spent the last two days talking at nauseum about ecosystem based management. Um, if you were to explain it to the lay person, how, wh what that means, cause it, it's a, it's a good term and it sounds great. What, uh, how would you explain it to somebody? Well, the way I think of it is, uh, not just a different way of, uh, of, of managing, but, um, an, a different way of interpreting what it is you're managing. Okay. So we tend to think of managing natural ecosystems like forest. We break it down in terms of managing caribou or managing grizzly bear, managing timber, managing water. Um, and for an ecosystem based approach, what you're managing is the whole thing. And mm -hmm. so that is uh, one of my best uh, quotes that I have from one of the papers is it's a seismic shift. Ah. It, 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 from a, from a fundamental perspective of, you know, feeling about what it is you're managing, mm -hmm. managing the entire ecosystem, not, not the individual pieces. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the most, uh, I think that's the, the best way of describing it. Okay. Would you, so would you say currently in, I mean, cause we're not just talking about forestry, we're talking about 
everything on the landscape from agriculture to everything, right? Um, would you say we are currently doing that? We're kind of we're currently in a uh, like people are very specialized and specific, and they're only managing their portion of it, and we're not collaborating. Would you say we we tend to manage things in in pieces, and that's what humans do when mm-hmm. you have a complex problem or a complex system. And ecosystems are about as complex as they come. <laughs> yeah. Human beings break the problem down into pieces. Yeah. We do it in factories when we were building cars. The military does it to organize, uh, you know, people and, and machinery, and that's how they get things done. For natural resource management, a classic way of breaking a complex problem down is say we have natural resources. There's timber. You manage timber over here, and here is going to be. Uh, the organization that's going to res- be responsible for that, mm-hmm. and then we'll allocate rights to timber. Mm-hmm. Then there is oil and gas, and then there is water, and then there is wildlife. Mm-hmm. And every piece of that gets a system for managing it, best management practices. Um, and that's the way we've built our systems for decades. Mm-hmm. And so this is a part of the reason why this is such a big change. So yeah. in answer to your question... <laughs> I don't think we do a lot of it right now okay. uh, because it, it is uh, managing holes instead of pieces is yeah. the way I, one of the ways I describe it. Mm. Um, and, and managing holes it means that all of the tools, all the mechanisms, the, the partnerships, managing holes also refers to, to how we do it. So doing it as a collective, not doing it as individuals, not doing it as individual agencies or companies or people, mm-hmm. but you do it together. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, we've gotten really good at, I think, at managing the things that we are managing, but it's, I I agree there's a, there's a disconnect between the values, between the concerns, right? And, and I think it's just, it's such a a daunting task to try and imagine, uh, like I think one thing, I've only been at the workshop, I, I think I was here for two hours in total or something, so I missed the majority of the good stuff, but, um, someone brought up a, uh, the idea of a, a province-wide uh, forest management plan, right? Or a province-wide management plan. So all the annual allowable cuts, all the all the water, everything's under one. You know, like the idea of that is so it's inc- it'd be great. But I mean, every little area has its own specific things it needs to manage for differently, and it's so the complexity is huge. Um, over the last two days, you think that, what have you guys? Do you think you've narrowed down how to start this process or kind of, you know what I mean, where to begin? Because I, f- I feel like we're, we've kind of already been on this road. I said this yesterday with Ed. I, f- I feel like we've kind of been trying to work towards this since, you know, for the, since the beginning kind of thing. We're just, we're always get, improving and getting better at management. But now this is the next step and it's a big one. Um, yeah, how do we how do we start this? Any ideas? <laughs> I, asked, I asked this of Ed and I was like, I know it's an impossible question, but... <laughs> What you know, do you think? I, I guess that is the million dollar question. And, and as you said, this isn't a new idea. It's been around for, uh, one could argue centuries. Um, Aldo Leopold talked about cogs and wheels and managing holes. Um, the, this, the, the, the genesis of where the, the, this newest version called the ecosystem based management came from is, is only about 30 years old. But mm-hmm. yes, a lot of the conversations that were going on then are going on today. And, uh, I think that's a, a, a testament to how complex a problem it is. And so um, the approach that we used today was a part of a process that, that we started probably about three years ago. Um, and at that time, the partnership that I represent um, as, as a part of FRI Research, um, they're called the Healthy Landscapes Program, and it's about... 15 or so forest management companies, uh, several provincial governments, um, and uh, other stakeholders uh, come and go. And there was a sort of the light came on that we're doing all this great research. It was very heavily physical research oriented. We study forest fires, we study landscape patterns, um, you know, publish papers. Mm-hmm. And we're producing this great amount of knowledge, and the uptake is underwhelming. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And, um, we started to notice that and started to talk about it. And I have worked across other parts of Canada and I'm a consultant. So I knew similar stories were going on in Ontario and in Quebec and apparently in Nova Scotia now and in other parts of the United States where 
you know, it's, we're, uh, we're having problems with traction. And so the backing up part, mm -hmm. uh, became talking with people and, there is a social aspect to, to EBM. Mm. And as a part of my research, of course, where I'm coming from, I it tended to be minimalized in favor of the physical research uh, that I do. But it became more and more apparent that you can't have one without the other. They have to be married. And we were completely missing the, the, the social part of it. So this workshop was the culmination of, of several steps that we had taken over the last couple of years to addressing that mm -hmm. and um, we realized the classic ways of solving problems weren't getting us anywhere we're mm -hmm. just going to be going around in circles so for these two days let's introduce some new techniques let's let's try something different let's try to build trust let's try to create the relationships and and we can worry about some of the technical details later mm -hmm. and i think <laughs> I'm being, I'm having that, you know, post workshop buzz. I think. <laughs> right. I think you're just tired. <laughs> you think, woohoo, we did something. And, and I would, uh, I guess I use the phrase cautiously optimistic mm -hmm. that we, um, provided the baseline to move some yardsticks forward. And I'm not after big wins. We are not, uh, we're not looking for that. For the workshop, we weren't thinking we're going to change the world. Mm -hmm. uh, my phrase to the planning team was, we just want some baby steps. We mm -hmm. just just want to, you know, know that we're moving in the right direction, and we're not going to worry about who's not in the room. We're not going to worry about the things we don't have control over. Mm -hmm. What can we do? Um, and the exercises, I think, directed people towards that mm -hmm. thinking and stop pointing fingers and stop, you know, uh, um, laying blame that it's you know it's someone else's fault take responsibility mm -hmm. you know look in the mirror and say what what can we do here and i i think that the group in that room mm -hmm. uh, took it pretty seriously yeah no it's such a <laughs> i keep saying this it's it, it, it's such a complex problem and it's to try and like you can say okay it's collaboration and trying to bring all the management levels together right um, and where to begin? It's like, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, excellent question. Right. Yeah. And it all seems to begin with public consultation and, and, and getting the public up to speed on what's important and how to do things. Right. Which is, I mean, that's the solution to every problem we've ever come across as a society, but it's, I think you're right. Like, I, I don't see a ton of that going on in the forest industry per se. Right. I mean, there, there's, those organizations trying to get out there and trying to and do that, but it, it's it's tough, right? And I think there hasn't been the flood of information online um, that there has been for other other causes or other industries or whatever, right? There just hasn't been that buzz around forest management and the importance of forests and water and, and soil and everything. So, yeah, I, I think I mean that's that's the same thing with this podcast was kind of part of it right is i wanted to kind of make this information easily available people can get interested and understand so um yeah ecosystem-based management man i'm still honestly like walking into this i was still <laughs> trying to figure it out myself I'm like what <laughs> does that mean exactly because it's in our plans right we plan around water we plan around habitat and everything but um I'm going to ask you the same question, actually, I asked Ed yesterday. Sure. Again, another impossible question. <laughs> Thanks. <All right. laughs> um, but it just keeps popping up in my mind anyways. It's re regarding how do we relate values equally. So, like, in my mind, I have a, a an equation that, like, a, a manager can go to and be like, okay, so I have this – I'll use the same example. I have this $100,000 piece of timber however it is nestled in with uh like woodpecker habitat or a bear habitat or and there's there's a, it's it's in the headwaters or something like that right how do we decide what is more important what takes precedence um you know what i mean how how it should be managed how do we weight those things because right now i think it's just this conceptual value right we're like well i like Grizzly bears. I want grizzly bears on the, on the landscape, right? And it, most people in their life will never see one, but they like the fact that it's there. So how do we bring, how do we bring that emotional value into management and make it concrete? You know what I mean? So that we can point to and be like, because everyone's going to have their own ideas. The conservation groups are going to, they're going to want the conservation over everything. The forest companies are going to want timber, most likely. The, 
whatever, right? Everyone's specified, like you right. said. Yeah. So what's the where's the middle ground? How do we sort <laughs> that out? And again, impossible question, but that's that's the stuff that people are going to ask, yeah. right? Okay, well, I'll answer it in a couple of different ways. And um, the way you've just described how the world works is is the way the world works right now. So that's the process we have to turn on its on its head. Mm-hmm. Is if we if we walk into a room and the process now is say let's let's all put our values on the table and that's the first thing we do mm-hmm. and um from there that process often becomes um very controversial very quickly <laughs> yeah it gets heated it, people it get angry yeah. it does and <laughs> and so so what, what caribou is a perfect example it, right it does right yeah. and and you inevitably end up with conflicts right you mm-hmm. you can never lay I don't know of a process in the world where you could lay all your values on the table and at the end of it, everyone says, oh, wow, everyone's got what they wanted. Right? <laughs> That's great. Now we can all go home, right? It's yeah. there, it's a battle. And um, well, people just all of a sudden, they, 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 they take a stand, right? When you are against what they want, a lot of times I find they sh- they shut down. They're not listening to you anymore and yeah. they're just yeah. standing that's, their ground and I'm like, no, I'm right. I'm not. And I'm, that's their agenda. Yeah. yeah. And that's their job. And that, and yeah, I, I see that a lot as well. And mm-hmm. so what the, what, what an ecosystem based approach offers is, is, oh, uh, and, and again, I'm going to, I'm going to say this is, is my version of it. It offers a way of, um, looking at something that you can agree on to put in the middle of the table, which is what is the future landscape that you want to have together? Mm-hmm. What does that, what does that look like? Let's, let's describe it. Yeah. And, and that forces you, to realize you can't have everything everywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, and then if the, and the, and the other element to this is, um, you know, we, the, the health of the ecosystem has to come first. Yeah. Because if we don't manage that ecosystem, we can't have all the values that, that we talk about. They won't exist. So if we keep managing this complex system one value at a time, mm-hmm. Um, we're going to be missing the big picture, which is oh, the health of our ecosystem is deteriorating and mm-hmm. its ability to keep all those services going is going to be diminished. So, um, yeah. so it's not just a, you know, a biodiversity issue. It's mm-hmm. not just a, you know, a, a feel good thing. It's, it comes down to, in many cases, an ecosystem approach comes down to, you know, basic, you know, economics. It's mm-hmm. like, if we're going to keep the flow of all things going, we better keep the mothership alive, and that's and that's the the, the ecosystem. Mm. So, so how do we do that, right? Where what are the benchmarks? What's what does a healthy ecosystem look like? And well, and that's just that, that's just it. I just want to interject quickly and just yeah. I, I think you hit a point already on the head, right? Is that if everyone's looking at their individual thing and not so, like say they uh, there's a ten percent loss here and a ten percent loss there, five percent or two percent, and we're like, oh well, no, we're doing well. There's only like slight loss here and there and everywhere, or climate's only going, climate change is only increasing a little bit. And this, but when you look at the entire picture, you're like, oh Jesus, like we're falling apart here. What's going on? Right, like we're on a trajectory that is 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 poor. So, um, sorry, continue on with your yeah, yeah. No, it's it's and. Um, I think we're at a, at a point in time now where exactly the scenario that you described, we can demonstrate that through scenario models. We can project landscapes into the future based on what, you know, a scenario we would call business as usual. Mm-hmm. If we keep making decisions the way we are today, we, you know, we'll look back 10 or 20 years. Let's, think, let's project that forward, you know, maybe with some yep. changes in things like, um, you know, industrial activity and fire regimes. We can take a look at you know, possible futures mm. said, is, is that where we want to go? Yeah. And, and in many cases, a lot of those are, um, uh, you know, uh, have features that we would, you know, generally we would say mm, those are pretty negative. We don't want to go in that direction. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what's, how do we determine what direction we want to go in and what are the guideposts for that? Yep. And, um, one, one of the, one of the key components of, um, ecosystem based management, um, is using our understanding of historical patterns and processes. Okay. So how did mother nature, uh, create these landscapes? What were the drivers? What are the pieces that belong uh, in, into it? How did, how did climate create, uh, you know, a fire regime in terms of, 
you know, the amount of fire on a landscape and what it, what it burns and what it doesn't and how does that create landscape conditions mm-hmm. and how does that create our values? And that's sort of the, you know, the Bible that I use in, in, in my research is mm-hmm. that if we, if we understand that process from climate disturbance, landscape conditions, and that's, you know, things like the amount of old growth, you know, patch size distributions, those are, those are things that we manage for. Yeah. And then out of that comes the consequences like fire threat, um, and, uh, the, you know, our, the amount of caribou habitat, the amount of grizzly bear habitat and mother nature has natural thresholds. Mm-hmm. You know, there's, there's a huge amount of variation that complicates things significantly right? yeah. because to some people you think, well, if mother nature can be infinite, then how is that useful? Right. It's not infinite. Um, there are it makes th- modeling difficult. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, and, and the dynamics makes it difficult, right? Yeah. Because we're used to having hard and fast rules that say thou shalt do this. It's mm-hmm. like mother nature is like, well, you could do that or this or this or this. And yeah. so it, it, uh, it makes everybody's job a bit harder. Mm-hmm. Um, but it put, it puts goalposts on what the ecosystem can do. Mm-hmm. And for a lot of the uh, jurisdictions in Canada, what this has translated into because of that hierarchy that I described is, well, what we really manage, if you think about it, we only really manage disturbance patterns. We're not managing anything else. Mm-hmm. We don't manage values. We don't manage caribou habitat. Mm-hmm. We don't manage... um you know, water quality, we manage the conditions under which those things, you know, hopefully occur. Right. And, and the only way we do that is through disturbance management. So we either choose to, um, you know, timber harvest, prescribe burning, but managing wildfire is the other part of this, right? Mm-hmm. So it, we've been managing wildfire quite successfully in a large part of the southern part of the boreal forest. Um, management being suppression management yeah. being suppression yeah. so we are influencing natural landscapes mm-hmm. by suppressing disturbance yep. and that's having impacts on the on the disturbance or on the on the landscape ecosystem so so yeah. that's our in mm-hmm. so a lot of the jurisdictions are saying well it, let's use that um, as our guide mm-hmm. so the presentations we heard uh, yesterday from Ontario and Quebec um, have taken that to the next step and made their uh, harvesting and disturbance um, requirements as a part of their forestry act. Mm-hmm. So from now on, you will use Mother Nature as some sort of a template okay. um, for creating disturbance patterns so that you can create landscapes that are closer to being within this these historic thresholds so how do they go about doing that how do you because I, I thought that was the idea behind current uh like timber harvest was that we we're emulating natural disturbance right so how how is this how is quebec and ontario different how have they changed the model well <laughs> the, the, <laughs> well, uh, well it, actually it it uh yes and no <laughs> um, the pattern of dis- the pattern of most forest harvesting that you see when you fly over much of Canada is that checkerboard pattern. Right, that was the old way of doing it. Yeah, and and you know the genesis of that was twofold, um, and it, and both of them were individual values. Mm-hmm. One was aesthetics. Nobody wants to see big clear cuts and no trees anymore. Yeah. So we're going to create some leaf patches and cut patches, and then we come back when. They've gotten bigger and mm-hmm. we'll take the rest of the wood and it'll look better. Yeah. The second is for moose. Mm-hmm. Um, in Ontario, they call them moose hotels. <laughs> moose was the caribou of the 1970s. And gotcha. so harvesting uh, patterns were designed to uh, encourage moose because of the browse that comes up. Right. So, so harvesting, yeah, harvesting it, enables more browse for moose, therefore supporting moose. Yeah. yeah. And so it, it wasn't exactly you know, emulating mother nature. Yeah. Um, so the, so the, the shift that's, that is actually happening now, I would say right across Canada is studying uh, at this scale, mm-hmm. at least because it is a multi-scalar effort, mm-hmm. but at the scale that we're talking about right now, for example, it would be, well, let's take a look at how fires burned and what they left behind, what, uh, where the residuals were, how much was left over mm-hmm. um, and then use that to guide our disturbance activities on the landscape. Mm -hmm. So that's one piece 
of, for example, of what the Ontario and the Quebec guidelines would include. Yes. Gotcha. Here's how you're going to, here's how your disturbances should look. We don't want them to look like checkerboards anymore. Right. When you fly over them in 10 or 20 years, mm-hmm. hopefully you won't even recognize that it's a harvest block. Right. And I recognize that like in the, I don't know, I don't know, I'm not sure when we started doing the checkerboard pattern, when we kind of stopped, but I feel like we haven't been doing the checkerboard for quite some time now. Well, I mean, there's, there, there's some, there's some going in and getting the second pass because yeah, it's there. There's a lot of legacies. There's that's, a lot of legacies. That's stuff. the problem. Right. So they've yeah. gone through, they've taken the first checkerboard, all the white pieces out. Yeah. And now they're going back through and getting all the black pieces out. Yeah. You know, has a, but yeah. Yeah. I feel like there's no, there's nothing, not making new ones anymore. The new cup locks that are, that are out there, they are, more they're following stand types and they're following uh, uh watersheds and they're following stuff like that um so is that is it are we not doing that here already too yeah like, i think that's like that's already the way we're kind of doing things. yes yeah, it okay. is and, and but that's but this is why this is where this is the genesis because of, of this, this is gotcha. where it, this is where it comes from and okay. yes there's um i think some of the oldest uh, cut blocks like this out there from the early 2000s so right. yeah I, the uh, most of the new stuff that you see flying over absolutely that yeah. it's it's gonna but this is this is where it comes from right because there's it's, like the new stuff has trees left over and it's it's just a weird pattern kind of like maybe what a fire would do or a, mm-hmm. or a windstorm or something or whatever yeah yeah um okay that, that's yeah. that part is also part art part science right because totally if you think about it the checkerboard you could lay that out on an aerial photograph and then go on the ground and GPS in your corners, flag it all out, and you tell an operator, okay, go in, cut here, don't cut here. Yeah. Job done. Yeah. The regulator says, thou shalt pay attention to the rules, and these are your rules, mm-hmm. and your checkerboards have to be this big and no bigger than this and no larger than this. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, checked off my box, I can go home now. Yeah. Now we've got <laughs> this range of... Uh, pattern types Mm -hmm. that mother nature could create um, and the those hard and fast rules kind of go out the window yeah so it's big time i would say what we're do what we've been doing over the last 15 years is learning that process of Uh if we're going to have to let go of hard and fast rules um, then how are we going to plan what it looks like on the ground um, so and, more fluid, I guess, more and, of a fluid management style. Roll with the punches rather than just kind of well sticking and, to the and, and more outcome based, mm-hmm. right? Right. Uh, like what is it? What is it? What's the kind of thing that we want to create here? Mm-hmm. Um, and some of the uh, it means some of the regulators have to give up a bit of control, right? Because it, it can't be where well, you went outside of your your boundary. Now mm-hmm. it it's um, it's more of a long term. You know, did you accomplish? what you what you had hoped to so Mm -hmm. so some so that was a learning process that i think uh we had to go through right and you know operators had to be retrained uh the whole planning process yeah i I remember walking out in the bush 15 years ago with with a planner with you know all the best intentions in mind Mm -hmm. he said i just want to go out and we can walk through a block and and we can talk through uh, what this is going to look like. Mm. And we walked out into the middle of an area and he said, this is going to be harvested next year. Tell me where to leave residuals. Yeah. Right? And, yeah. and the expectation was I was going to point out where the residuals were going to be. And I said, well, my response was you can leave them anywhere in, in a lot of different places. <laughs> and, I, and I'll tell you where they tend to occur, but you have to integrate. This is, and this is the, the, uh, one of the advantages of this approach is, now you can integrate those other values into this process. Yeah. So are there nesting birds somewhere nearby? Well, there, there you go. There's a residual. Is yeah. it a, is it a sensitive or a steep site? Well, that makes sense as a residual as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, uh, that's, that's, that's where the, the multiple values come in and being able to see, you know, the whole system, the forest, the habitat, the water, the everything, right? It's, yeah. it's a part of it. And, and we're mm-hmm. only talking at, you know, at one scale now. I this mean, is just this is just harvesting cut blocks. Yeah, well, we're yeah. just really talking about the stand scale, but the yeah. whole, the the principle applies at at all scales, big time, and all the way up to literally millions of hectares. Mm-hmm. So, um, I'll give you another example of uh, you know something we can learn from Mother Nature is um, let's let's we understand um, or we have we have some models that suggest the sort of habitat that woodland caribou like Mm -hmm. and what we can do now is we have the modeling capability to track 
how and where those habitat types move around on the landscape over yeah. millions of hectares. Mm -hmm. And now we've got a template for, you know, understanding how, you know, if, if we want to manage caribou, um, then maybe this is a useful model for suggesting how, you know, one of the ways in which we might do it. Yeah. Yeah. There's so much, I have a million questions, but it's like, we are, I can't do this forever, but, <laughs> and I'm getting down, I'm getting caught down rabbit holes of specific issues like sure. caribou and fire and, and whatever. Right. Um, I'm trying to stay focused on the ecosystem based right. management part sure. of it, but, um, <sighs> Yeah, I guess it's it's still, yeah, it's still confusing in my mind to try and understand because like we need to start bringing in uh, like indigenous populations more and and seeing their side of things, and we need to start bringing in uh, recreators and and trying to manage for what they want, but also not just what they want, but what is scientifically feasible and good for everybody, right? So, yeah. It's just a crazy problem. I don't yep. even. I don't even know. I, I, I'm. I'm impressed at, at what you guys managed to accomplish this last couple of days. Just because it's. It just seems like there's a million places to start, and nobody really knows what the end result looks like. So I guess. Um, well, and that's why we had. <laughs> I'm not going to say low expectations for the workshop, right. but we didn't have unrealistic expectations that we're going to solve. The, the world's problems, right? That's the joke I made when I came in today. So you guys figured it out, right? We're yeah. done. We got this. Exactly. We got ground rules. We got <laughs> exactly. I mean, I'm I'm sure if you if you interviewed people walking out of that workshop mm -hmm. um, and walking in uh, both ways, and you asked them what their defin just their definition of EBM was, mm -hmm. you'd still get fifty different answers yeah. walking out. This, you know, they may be different than the ones walking in. You'd still get different ones. So, yeah. so we're still talking about different versions yeah. of this as a, as a concept. Yeah. Um, but, uh, I, th I think, I think, uh, the way we have to approach a complex problem is in terms of bites that we can take off totally. where we have a, not a, not a, 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 not a really high chance of success, but reasonable chance of success. And then we've got to be ready for failure. We've got to say, Sometimes this isn't going to work. If we're, mm -hmm. if we're going to affect change, if we're going to push people outside of their comfort zones, we've got to be respectful. We've got to be careful. We've got to do it collaboratively. We've got to do, we've got to think more like some of the sessions that we uh, had, especially today mm -hmm. in that workshop where we solve problems differently, but we do them together. Yeah. So we've got to bring a lot of different tools to the table and be patient. Um, and my, piece of that as the lead for this healthy landscapes program and the partnership is we're going to be humble in terms of the pieces that we can bite off yep well and that's kind of what i was thinking i was i mean like you said we've been doing this talking about this idea for 30 years right and i mean we could talk ourselves into affinity right like this we could just talk about what we want to do forever and unless there is action, unless we're doing something and heading in a direction, and yeah, like you said, it's not going to be perfect, right? So we need to start somewhere with something and adjust course. That's At least that's my opinion. I, there's people that would disagree with me and that we need to start at the 10,000-foot level and yep. work down. That might be true too. I don't know. But personally, I feel like you just need to start walking, and mm -hmm. just adjust course as time goes on, right? And I think, like you said, if we if we try to start from the provincial or, or 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 national or international level and work down, we're going to be tied up for another thirty years or a hundred years and trying to figure out well, how how do we do this perfectly? Because new light, new things are always coming to light, new information, and so everything's always changing. But um, yeah, I, I feel like if we can get people like we did like you did today from different parts of the of of society right we've got conservation groups and there is public here i think and there was there was forest groups and there's government and there's we need we need more right we need the the uh grazing lease holders we need the recreators we need whatever right they're talking about carbon capture talking about climate change all of this stuff yeah. and yeah. if we can get it's almost like we need to start collecting these people and getting them at the same table or we can sit at a round table and discuss this and start to lay out where we begin. And I don't know if that starts at like a watershed basis or an FMA basis. Like, you know what I mean? You start this, give each 
force management unit their own, you know what I mean, their own council to sort out what their local stuff is. Right. And then you work up or do you start from the pro- provincial? And I think, I don't know. It's just, it's just such a, I think we need to start is all I'm trying to say. I think yeah. we need to just start walking in a direction and see where it takes us because otherwise we'll just be talking about it forever. And I think, um, uh, first of all, I, um, we have started. Yeah. And, and so the, the baby steps have begun. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's interesting that, you know, your observation was, you know, aren't we doing cup blocks that look like fire already? You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's commonplace. And the, the very first one in Western Canada that was installed, I was a part of the design of that and it was in, um, Saskatchewan. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, we laid that out and it was the first one that looked, looked like a fire yeah. and the pushback from the communities, the stakeholders, there were uh, people that used that area for, for yeah. trapping. Yeah. It was huge. It was absolutely huge. And um, they, because there, it was fear of change. We don't know what it's going to look like. There was, you know, some trust issues. Um, and then as soon uh, they they got permission to, to put it in, and um after it was in there they toured people around and they loved it i said well well this is what you're talking about yeah. oh yeah we're fine with this and then all of a sudden everyone it sort of caught fire and everyone started doing it but but you got to go first yeah. you got to take that first step and that and and that first step was as scary as whatever next step we're about to take Big right time. and it became commonplace so yeah. so we're moving we're getting there and i would also say i'm i'm <laughs> I'm a bottom up guy. I, I tend to think influence from doing small things up to, you know, having people that have influence over policy and practices, you know, notice, take notice of it and, and integrate it. I like that too. I, I think that works. Yeah. And so uh, an outcome of this workshop, uh, I would be perfectly happy with one of them uh, examples being two of the partners in that room begin to plan together. Mm-hmm. To for 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 totally. either two resources or for um you know two adjacent you know a park beside an FMA yeah those things are actually starting to happen there yeah. are examples of those in in Alberta mm-hmm. so so there are bits and pieces of this happening so the the next steps out of this workshop don't have to be you know masterful strokes they mm-hmm. can just be you know what's the low hanging fruit what are we not seeing I agree and you know and and just having building the trust within that room, I heard some people within the government say, you know, let's just try something. Yeah, totally. And, and I don't know if those discussions would have happened five years ago. You right. know, are yep. we ready to try something out there on the landscape? So mm-hmm. um, I, I was encouraged by the collective desire to, and maybe the, to take what is maybe uh, the next step, which is maybe a, a bit of a bigger one. Mm-hmm. But, but we'll see. Totally. Uh, yeah. No, I agree. I think... Uh, I think it's seeing us all as, as collaborators and as, as partners in this. And like, sure, you understand this board better than I understand. And I understand this better than you do. And let's talk about it. And we're going to disagree on stuff, but let's continue to not be emotional and let's take the rational, logical approach at this and not just shut each other down because we disagree. So it's, and I agree. I think it's, I, I see it more and more every day. It seems like even in my personal employment, it's, it seems like, everything we, we seem to be working together rather than being like you screwed this up fix it right it's more like hey what do you think about this and we change it we just course yeah. right and i think yeah. you're right i think if, if if from today's just the idea of today's discussion in this workshop if you could if a bunch of people left here with this idea implanted in their mind of doing this all it takes is for them to reach out to the indigenous community and to the, the exactly. atv users and the yeah. blah 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 and so i think i think you're right i think i, I think this will plant a seed in a lot of people's heads this workshop and 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 help us move in that direction and there was a lot of influential people here right that have mm-hmm. a lot of a lot of you know a lot of sway in what's going on it's a good cross section big it was. time yeah yeah and and i think the other uh the other thing to keep in mind is that i think people are realizing that you know what's what is our other option and and there aren't a whole lot of other options on the table other than the way we're doing things now. Yeah. And I think the reason we get so much uptake on people who say EBM's a good thing, regardless of what their definition of it specifically is, mm-hmm. um, because there isn't 
really another option. What else are we going to do? Yeah. If we keep going the way we're going um, or doing nothing, doing nothing is still a, a choice, right? To totally. Do, to, to do nothing. Yep. And it can still have consequences and they can be negative. Yep. So I Absolutely. think they're, you know, the recognition of, okay, we've got, we've got this great idea. Mm -hmm. It's really complicated. Mm -hmm. It's going to take a lot of work. And I think what we learned today is it's going to make some people feel uncomfortable mm -hmm. on, you know, as maybe professionally, maybe personally. Um, but, um, it's, that's, that's going to be everybody, right? Yeah. It's not just you. you Got to swallow We're, your pride and, and, and work through it for the better. Right. And uh, I, and I have to say that the exercise that we went through this morning, uh, with the Rios group, I think revealed to everybody how we can problem solve without being, you know, butting heads and without being controversial and without, um, you know, and also without agreeing on everything. Right? Totally. You can, you can yeah. still find solutions without agreeing on, you know, all of the steps required to, you know, to, you know, solve your classic problem. Mm -hmm. And I think that light came on for a lot of people. It's like, okay, we, we just acknowledge this is a complex problem um, and we come together in in creative ways using tools we haven't used before, mm -hmm. uh, but they're out there um, that, you know, we can make some headway and maybe it's, maybe they're baby steps, mm -hmm. but it's their steps. Uh, it's awesome. I think it's, I, I think you're right. I think it seems like everyone's moving in the same direction. We're starting to see eye to eye, starting to come to terms and, and make compromises and try to understand that, yeah, we might lose a little bit of ground here and there, but overall, I think if you look at it from, who was it? Um, oh, Teddy Roosevelt, I think said the, uh, the quote about, uh, we're not managing our landscape for our children or our children's children, but for those still locked in the womb of time. And I'm like, ah, <laughs> I love that quote. <laughs> good one. That's but it's, one. uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's for 200 years from now, a thousand years from now. I mean, there's climatic changes and stuff that'll change, but I mean, we look at, it, I think ultimately, if you look at it from what is best for the people that are going to be alive a hundred years from now, that is ultimately probably the right choice. Yeah. And the, you know what I mean? The temporary fix for something that looks good now, but may have problems down the line is ultimately problematic. And yeah. I think, but this, this is awesome. I love, I love this workshop. And even though I was only here for a couple hours, I got a pretty good idea of kind of the, the mindset out there. And it was, it was interesting. So yeah. Um, do you have any kind of final things that you want to say to sum up this whole idea or any advice for people that want to maybe move in this direction where to find resources or anything like that? Um, well, I, um, as I said, the, the group that I work with is called the Healthy Landscapes Program at FRI Research, and it is one of the only uh, multi -stakehold, existing multi-stakeholder groups in Western Canada, mm -hmm. I think all of Canada, that, that has its mandate to explore uh, the science behind this. And now, of course, we're moving into social science and communications as, as a part of what we do. It's mandatory. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say, um, definitely that it's, it's, it's a very, uh, open ended group. And if nothing else from this workshop, we realize, you know, we're, we're going to have to be maybe even broader, right. In, mm -hmm. in terms of our partnership. So, um, that's our, that's our, our main resource. We've got a, a couple of um, a couple of websites for people that are interested. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the ones that teaches about e eco uh, ecosystem-based management concepts is called Lessons from Nature. Mm -hmm. Lessons from really nature cool website, actually. .ca. Thank you. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. Um, uh, that was uh, Matthew Piper from Fuse Consulting and I who put that together. Yeah. Um, and then another one that is uh, more interactive, and it, that one is more focused on an individual's um, research mm -hmm. site. Um, it's called less, um, sorry, landscapes in motion, yep. landscapes in motion.ca. And that one's updated every two weeks with a new blog. Nice. It's more personal, mm -hmm. um, but it'll give you a sense of, you know, the sort of research that we do it. That one doesn't really talk about the science, but, mm -hmm. or sorry, it doesn't talk about the social science. It's more of the physical science. What are we, what are we discovering about mother nature and, and the patterns on the landscape mm -hmm. before, you know, before we were here? Mm -hmm. Um, and then I guess the, the other one would be the, uh, you know, the FRI website. We have done, uh, webinars, a, a series of four are on there from the healthy landscapes and you'd be, um, you know, you can, uh, you're welcome to download those and, and listen to those as well. Awesome. Yeah. Perfect. Well, thanks a lot for coming on and doing this. That was, uh, 
you know, we flew through the times. Yeah. Well, yeah. my pleasure. Thank yeah. you. It was awesome. Thanks.